oh, we're going to look at putting the neck back on the guitar now. And rather than using the HD28 that I've been using, we're going to start with the uh, D41 that's been in a couple of the videos. The reason is um, the HD28 is over there getting glued up for the uh, popsicle brace crack that I showed in a, a different video. Also, this 41 needs a little bit less of a neck reset, so it'll go a little bit faster, which is good for this video. i got to get something here. We're going to need this. I forgot to get this. I tried to get everything together, you know, before I get started. So, Okay, so first thing I did that I've already done is to clean up both sides of the joints here. And I use a tapered sanding stick like this. See, the sides are tapered, and it's just got 120 grit. It lets you get in here like this and clean the sides really well. And I'll also use my fingers and, and fold over sandpaper several times to get that clean. Part of the reason I want to clean is for the shims to stick, but I also want to get all that old glue out of here so the neck will slide on real well so I can check it. So, this guitar is not going to need much of a reset, about 15 thousandths of an inch, but it needs to be perfect. So, that's why I'm doing it. Okay, I forgot one more thing over here. Ah, <laughs> uh, where are you? Here it is. Oh, that's your... Okay, let's show... A lot of people know that the um, the test of running a straight edge down the fingerboard. So here's a straight edge. I'm going to run it down here. And it clears the fingerboard already by a lot. So the straight edge is not going to kiss the bridge when there's no tension on the neck. It's going to clear it by quite a bit. Now, if you recall... When I was taking this neck off, I said, that's a sloppy fit. It's way too tight up here at the top, and it's loose at the bottom. The steam is coming out almost immediately. Sometimes on marginal neck resets like this guitar, you will find that simply taking the neck off and putting it back on can sometimes get the geometry pretty good because they didn't get the neck on tight, and it's, it takes an amazing amount, amazingly little amount of movement at the heel to make a big difference up here. So, first thing I'm going to do, show you how, how I prep the guitar here. So after I've cleaned it and everything, then I get some blue tape, run off a piece. If you got sticky blue tape, put it on your shirt or something, take the tack off of it so it doesn't peel your finish off. Put it right up, I'll show you, put it right up against the neck like this. Right up like that. That way, I don't scuff the finish up too much when I'm doing this. Put your neck on. I have sandpaper strips. Depending on how much I have to take off, if I only have to take, you know, 10 to 20 thousandths of an inch, I just go straight to the strip. If I've got to take off 30, 40, or 50, sometimes even 60 thousandths, then I use the same little sanding block right here. And I actually just sand on the edges of the neck a little bit. But in this case, and then I come back to the sanding strip. But in this case, we're just going to go. Because it's not going to take much. This is 120 grit sandpaper. 150, 120 grit. It's backed with strapping tape. This to me has been the key. Is to back it with strapping tape. It's slick that way. And you can, you can yank out all day long and it won't tear. So basically, I've got sandbags down here on the bench. The bench, this bench is lower than my other bench so that it puts the, you know, right here I can see it. And basically just kind of tilt the neck over, put your sanding strip in there, and you pull. Like that. This will automatically taper the heel because as you pull, this part here gets that much sanding time, whereas this section here gets the, a whole sanding time. So that will automatically taper the neck back, which is what you want. When you get ready for your final fit, and you, you like the neck angle and everything, and you're going to and you're going to try to make the um, edges better, then you're going to use very short little strokes, like this. And there's another little subtle thing that I do, and it's the amount of tension or where I put the tension on the neck. So I've got a hold of the neck here. When I'm trying to take it off the heel, I'll 
put some tension backwards on the neck. So I'm pushing this way on the neck, put a little bit more tension on the, on the rear of the heel. When I'm fitting the neck, I will push down this way so as to get even tension. If I need to, for some reason, take it off the front, I actually will pull the neck forward a little bit and make the heel clear so that I get just sanding at the very front of the neck. And you might need to do that sometimes in order to collect, correct a left to right, an E to E imbalance. You'll sometimes have to take a little bit off the front. Just, I mean, we're talking a tiny amount here. It's not going to change the intonation or anything like that. It's a fine tuning to get it right. So I'm going to go to the other side, give it a couple pulls. And because this neck is clearing really well already, after I cleaned up the glue, cleaned up the old shims that I didn't think were very good, I'm not going to go too far on this without checking it. And basically, this is the this is the technique: sand check, sand check, sand check, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Some guitars will go real easy, and you'll get them fairly quickly. Some guitars will be in here for hours. Now I've got this jig here. This is nothing more than a long bar clamp. It's got a cork at one end with some um, friendly plastic, you know, it's basically just a padded end over here. It fits into a little channel on my workbench, which is just a little two by twos screwed down under the workbench. It's tricky because I'm trying to do this with one hand. Sits on there, keeps it from falling over. I can scoot it back and forth as I want to because I want more support here. I'd rather work down here, you know. So I set this in here. Put that down. Got a little tile over the bar. Set that right up against the butt plate. And then I have, where'd it go? There it is. I got this that I made out of friendly plastic. And, uh, you know, it really doesn't fit the, the heel like this. It'll, it'll tilt forward. It'll really only fit the, the base, but it still works. So I'm going to set it in there, move my clamp back. Set that in. Give it just a lift, a little bit of tension. Get a set of... Uh, Classic bridge pins. And I'm going to take the ease. When I coil strings up here at the headstock, I always do the two E's. Actually, what I do, and this is, I take the G and the D, and I coil them up and put them up there. And then I take the B and the A, and I coil them, and I put them up there. And then I do the two E's, and I coil them, and I put them last. And that way, I can take the two E's off and not disturb the other strings. And I can check here, okay? I think that's not the saddle I wanted. The saddle I wanted was in the guitar. But that was pretty good. So I'm going to take my knees, run them down here. And I'm going to look for the alignment this way. That's one thing I'm looking for. Okay. Get my chill. So I normally just kind of run back and forth and get chills. I'm trying to get more efficient for this video. I'm not sitting there waiting. This thing is so great when you're doing a guitar. Like Put just a little tension on it. It doesn't have to be a pitch or anything like that. I know from long experience. Let's see. Okay. Because I have taller frets on it, it's hitting the nut. That's going to give me an inaccurate measurement. So, I'm going to bring uh, two of these. These are the fret slot markers, uh, fret slot protectors. And they are 20 thousandths of an inch, which is what I want. So I'm going to put that under here to simulate the correct nut height because if you don't do that your axis is going to be too low and you're going to get a bad reading so anyways i know from long experience having tested this back and forth 
Then when the guitar is in this set state, where there's just a little tension on the E's, no other strings on here, I happen to know that 60 thousandths of an inch at the 12th fret would give me pretty close to 93 thousandths of an inch once it's strung up and under tension. And again, I tested all this, you know, um, take a guitar that, that's got the action I want, put it in here, shut it down, take the strings off except for the low, uh, except for the E's and check the measurements, see what it is. So, and of course, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adjust it at the saddle, but I want to get this pretty close. I can't tell you how many times this little jig has saved my butt on an neck reset. Um, the straight edge will be, you know, the straight edge will be, God, a quarter of an inch off the bridge, and you think, oh, that's way too much. The action will be high. Um, it's, it's weird stuff on geometry sometimes. All right, so here's 60. It's always best to just check the thing. I'm a, I'm a very direct measurement guy. Some people talk about, for instance, the radius of the saddle. Oh, the radius of the saddle has to match the fingerboard. No, it doesn't, because the low E is going to be higher than the high E. And therefore, if you have a stair-stepping action that goes down, then the radius of the saddle is actually going to be about 20, 20, 20 inches. So if this is a 16-inch radius on the fingerboard, the radius on the saddle is going to be around 20 inches. But I don't care what this is, because the saddle is designed to set the action. So I don't go with an indirect measurement over here. I go with a direct measurement on the action. What is the action? Set the saddle, you see? I don't, you know, I don't care what radius this is. I want the action I want, okay? So I'm, I'm big on direct measurements. I don't do indirect measurements. Running the straight edge down here is an indirect measurement. It's just a, an indirect measurement that can help you find problems. Okay, so always measure the thing. So here's sixty thousandths of an inch. Man, it's there. So sixty thousandths. Yeah, it's actually just a little bit low, and that saddle's a little bit low. Man, I like it. <laughs> That's why I picked this guitar because I didn't think it was going to take much. Now I have sanded on it a little bit before we started here, you know. I like the alignment of the E's. That's what I'm looking at right here. How do the E's run down the fingerboard? If they're not, and again, if it looks good, it is good. And I've measured these things, you know, so many times before that I can tell you that if it looks good, especially when you've got white binding right here to help you, you know, help you line up that string. Um, I like that. I'm not going to make any adjustments. If I had to, I'd come up here and work just a little bit up on the top here to move the neck back and forth. And it doesn't take much. And once you've done that, then you've got to recheck your action and all that. Because a little bit of movement up here will really cause that neck to shift. That's how sometimes if I get one that's overshot, um, I can work a little bit up here at the heel, up at the top, uh, underneath the fingerboard. And I can bring that neck back up a little bit. And then readjust it. It's tricky, you know. There's there's angles you got to control. It's just like an airplane. You got to control this one. You got to control this one. And then you got to control this one. The way you control this one is the material off the bottom of the heel. The way you control this is with material up at the top of the heel. Whether you take finish off or whatever, you control it up at the top. And then the way you control this one uh, is a little trickier. The way you control the side-to-side -side roll is up here at the fingerboard. And it's very common for vintage, and I'm talking 30s, 30s Martins, to have a lot of roll this way for one reason or another. The fingerboards are not even, something like that, and they really roll this way or another, which causes the saddle to be really high on one side and really low on the other side. Usually it's the other way around. Usually it's really low on the base side and really high on the treble side. I got a 1933 OM28 one time, and I was the first person to do neck reset on that guitar, and man, I ended up with almost no saddle over here and a massive saddle on this side. And I had no choice but then to, to roll the neck over. Um, yeah, it was tricky, you know. <laughs> I had to actually shim underneath one side of the fingerboard to bring that fingerboard up, and then the heel consequently scooted over like this and it left a little bit of a witness mark there you know where you could see 
But, you know, I had no choice. And I tried not to take any finish away or anything like that. So it was a tricky neck reset. This one's like the most straightforward neck reset I've ever had. <laughs> okay, so I like that. We're good to go. I'm going to check the fit on the um, neck to the, to the body again. So to do that, I'm going to take my tape off. And I'll tell you what, the next one's going to be a bear. I did a little video once for a friend of mine. He said I want some stuff with neck reset, so I did one. And I got the worst neck reset I've ever done. <laughs> and I got on a video, you know, where I had all kinds of problems. Sometimes, when you have to take a lot of material off the heel, sometimes the heel right here will bottom out on the neck block. And when you go to put the shims in, the, the, the little rise and you think man what's going on here and you have to get in here and take a little material off in order to get some clearance on it but this one's this one's looking good I didn't think I'd have too much trouble with this one it looked to me like just a sloppy fit and like I said all along on this 41 it was very very marginal for a neck shot but to get it right that's what it needed and you know, D41 ought to be right, you know. So, I'm going to take my tape off carefully. You now, you can be as careful as you want. <laughs> and when you pull finish off, that's it. You know, you don't get it in warning. It doesn't have a red flashing light that says, Warning, warning, you're about to pull finish off. It just comes off. But you pull it off slowly. So, I'm going to look at this now. I'm going to put some tension down here. I'm going to take a look at this joint. And it's not too bad. I look at the heel, make sure the heel is relatively flush, and I'll show you a trick on doing the heel. This side's high. This side's got a gap in it, so that means that this side here over here is a little bit high. Two things can be happening. One, this can be high, or you can have the heel not being flat and it's causing it to rock. So I like to rock the neck, and it's just pretty snug. So I'm going to take this sandpaper and I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to strop right at the very end. I actually like to have just a little bit of a gap right there. When you look at it right here, I like to see that. Just a tiny, tiny little gap. And that means that I'm not putting all the weight of the heel on the end cap, which would be bad. So don't panic if you look at a guitar and you see a little bit of air right at the very end. That's okay. You know, that means that the dovetail proper is taking the weight of it. If it closes completely down, then you can never be sure if all of the weight is on the last eighth of an inch, and that's not good. So now I'm going to fit this just a little bit better. I'm going to move the sandpaper just a little bit. And I'm putting equal pressure on the neck as I do this. Blow the dirt out of there. This one's probably going to fit pretty good over here. Just a little. Take a look at it now. Yeah, that's not nicer. <laughs> that looks really good now. Really nice. Excellent. I like that. Yeah? If you don't like it, you got to keep at it. You can use a finer sandpaper sometimes in that 120, but I found it looks pretty good. I'm going to set the body over here. And now I'm going to reorient the camera so that we can see what I'm going to do over here. Okay, here's a Stumac Vice. Uh, normally I'll run it this way, but I'm going to run it this way so maybe you can see a little bit better. Put the neck in there. Get this out of the way. Put my tools back over here. What we're going to do now is put shims on the neck. Oh, I didn't show, but one thing I do um, <clears throat> when I've got the neck and the body. Oh, let me just get the body. Okay. Right here. I get a feel for how much shim I'm going to have to have on this. 
So I just put the neck in here, no shear in the gut, and flex that. Pull it forward, and I look at the gap right here, and that's going to give me an idea of how much shim I'm going to have to have. That's not moving a lot. It's not going to take much shim. This is just a matter of experience. If it comes up, you know, a lot, and this is a really sloppy fit, I know I'm going to have to use a thicker shim. But in this case, it's not going to take much. Okay, let's put the neck in here. This is something I've been doing for the past couple of years, and it's made my life so much easier. And that is, I actually super glue the shims onto the heel. And I used to use, you know, whatever glue I was going to use on the neck, and put them on there, and then clamp them with these little, these little guides right here. I'd clamp it on like that, rubber band it, and leave it. And it would take, you know, two or three hours for the glue to dry. One day I decided I'm going to try this, and, and man, it's been working fantastic. So. These are mahogany shims, and I have a friend who works, uh, who owns a cigar shop. It turns out that cigars come packed with these really thin mahogany pieces of wood. And, you know, it's a piece of wood like this bigger show. He gave me a stack of them down there. I cut them up with scissors, and I make these shims, and they have saved me so much time. Thank you very much, Danny. <laughs> these things are awesome. Uh, I used to, you know, plain plain shims and then your shims would curl and they'd be different thicknesses. It's hard getting good mahogany that wasn't punky that would, you know, peel these things. Whew. Okay, so what I do is just use my glue boost here and slap some super glue on it. Then set that over there. Take the Glue Boost Accelerator and spray just a light little coat right down there. Take my shim. You got about five seconds to do this. Smear it like that. Pop. Get this piece of wood. Press it on so that you don't glue your fingers to it. Hold it. Done. Shim to glue on. Gosh, that's so much faster. And you're still going to have the neck glue is still going to be glued to the wood. You're not gluing on to super glue. Plus, when you put the neck in, hold on a sec. You want to always keep your glue away from your accelerator. Or you're going to ruin a whole bottle of glue that way real quick. Put that on. Get my pressure. Press. Okay. A neck. A neck is really not dependent upon the glue to hold it in. So that's a mistake a lot of people make because they, they use way too much glue in that dovetail. Makes the neck harder to take off and it's just not necessary. A good fitting dovetail ought to fit into that. In fact, you're going to have to actually press it for the last 30 seconds of an inch. You know, you're going to have to press that down just a little bit. All the glue does in a dovetail is to keep it from popping out. Okay? You can put a neck together without any glue whatsoever, string it up to full tension, and it should not budge. Under full tension, it ought to look just like it's glued together. Therefore, and once I realized that, you know, and then people say that a lot, but once I realized that, I started thinking about it. I said, you know, the glue doesn't do anything then. The glue is just there to keep the neck, the dovetail from popping out. It should not keep the neck onto the body because if it does, then you're dependent upon that glue bond to hold that neck on. And when the guitar gets hot or humidity changes or whatever happens, you got a terrible neck reset. That's the whole purpose of a dovetail is to pull that into it. So, my point being is I really don't care if the glue, the fish glue that I'm going to use, I don't care if it touches a little bit of super glue on the way because it's still going to stick. I have found fish glue to be very, very forgiving, amazingly forgiving at contaminants. Hot hide glue is not it's very unforgiving of any kind of contaminant in there. But I have found fish glue to be pretty good stuff. 
Okay, so. I mean. Gosh, you know, I used to have to wait hours for these shims to die. No longer. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start fitting the neck. And this is the most tedious part of the whole thing. No matter how easy it was to take material off the heel, fitting that shim is going to be the same time-consuming process. First of all, I'm going to look at this heel here. And the shim runs up to here. If you recall, I was talking about the balance point on the heel. And this shim is a little too long. So right off the bat, I know I'm going to have to shave a little bit down right here because I don't want it contacting up here. I don't want this to be the um, aggressive point. I don't want this to be the contact point of the heel. I want this to be the contact point so that I know I've got a good firm grip in there. So right off the bat, I know I'm going to have to shave that down a little bit. Put this neck back in here. And I'm going to get my chisel which I should have got earlier, but didn't. So I've just got my little quarter inch chisel and I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to shave off a little bit here. I'm going to leave the shim. I'm just going to take it off a little. Taper it into the neck, basically. Okay. Like that. See, I just tapered it a little bit right there to ensure that it goes in easy. Same thing over here on this side. I guess everybody's got their techniques, you know, but I hold, I hold this down with my thumb and I just push. Shave that off. Help us have nice sharp chisels. My son has gotten into knife making and so he's really good at sharpening stuff and I just hand him my chisels and say here go sharpen them and he likes that now I'm going to do a test fit and like I expected it's it's high right here which is what I want I don't want it to sit down there but now here's where the trick comes in I'm push with it pretty good and I'm going to now wiggle this and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull forward this way and see if the heel fits The heel's not coming off yet. Now I'm going to lift it. And I got lift. You see that? So, I know that at this point, the, what's the word I want? The contact point, the, the wedge point. I know that it's wedging right here because I can't lift it up that way, but I can lift it up this way. If it was wedging up in here, I wouldn't be able to lift it up this way, but it would tilt, it would rock back and forth on this fulcrum point right here. And if it was binding up here, I'd be able to lift the heel, but I wouldn't be able to lift the front. And I've, I've learned this by using um, chalk. You know, I put chalk on there and see where the contact point is. And I've just learned this because, you know, I've done, what, 500, 400 necklaces, hundreds of them. So that's good. That's what I want to see. I want to see all the contact point back there. Now, normally I work at my other bench for this, so this is a little bit cumbersome here. But it's all right. Put that in there, get my chisel out of the way. Take the same sanding stick, and I'm just going to sand it now. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the end here than I am up in the middle. I don't want to take too much in the middle yet. I'm just going to sand that down. This time, I'm also going to sh uh, place where I cut the shim. I'm going to blend it into the neck a lot better now with the sanding stick. You can use the chisel and take off a lot of wood, but if you blow it, you're going to have to put a new shim in there. So I'd rather work slower, more checks. I'm going to have to scrape my shim off and put another shim on and start all over again. Another thing I do because because you know you gotta glue these up, you wear the sandpaper off. So I go over here and I grab a little chunk of sandpaper like this. I do a lot of these and I back them with um what is it two inch two inch strapping tape and I make these things look great. You fold them over a couple times and they'll be really stiff. And you can come in like this and use your thumb and you can focus on this. And this way I get a fresh piece of sandpaper. I don't wear out my sanding sticks. 
which is another thing that you kind of got to do is I got to rebuild my sanding sticks every so often. And yeah, you probably end up with a little bit of curve or crop or whatever by using the thumb, but you're going to work on that later. So it's not take too much. Just check it out. Get in there. I work it down a little bit. I'm going to constantly pull on the back. Back staying down. Oh, see, the front's not lifting as much now. So that means I'm getting a much better contact. I'm getting more even contact. Yeah, it's getting a little bit harder to lift the front. I do want, you know, pretty good contact on the contact point. That's the other side. I was on this side. I can see it's feathered. So let's go over here, take my sanding paper again, and that. This is the most tedious part. This is where your time comes in. And also keep in mind, this is a pretty easy neck reset. Um, so you think, oh man, that's not worth 300 bucks, but don't forget, you get a new saddle out of it too. And a saddle all alone is $45, so, you know, there's a lot that goes in here, plus you're paying me for my experience. And believe me, I've had tough neck, neck resets where I earned my 300 bucks. Now, I'm getting a little bit of pull at the heel now. So that tells me that it's, it's binding right up in here. And I could check this by putting chalk on there if I wanted to, but I already know what's going on because I could tell by the way it's rocking. So now I'm going to sand up here into the middle of my shim a little bit more. I'm going to leave the end of it alone. I'm going to sand up at the middle where I shaved it. I think that's what's binding. Just a little. Flip it. I watch these uh, bound fingerboards because the binding will shrink over time and it'll look like a gap. It's not. It's actually the binding shrunk. You need to know where the actual fingerboard is sometimes. It still isn't there, but it's getting there. Yeah, I got just a little bit of rock. Pulling up just a hair, starting to fit. I can tell the fulcrum points right here because that's where it's not moving. The end's coming up just a tiny bit. The front is pretty good, but it's stuck right in the middle. So focus on that point a little bit. Right there, not in the middle of my shim. trying to get this done today because we're going to go ride dirt bikes and I learned <laughs> the hard way that you should get your work done before you go riding because you just never know what's going to happen. I've got a I've got a three piece collarbone right here and I've got a plate and eight screws three, six, eight screws on it. Hmm. You know that old saying about whether you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right. Well, it's baloney. <laughs> there was this jump. I had a brand new Kawasaki KX250F, my second ride. And I'm at the track, and um, there's a double jump, you know, where you got to clear a gap. And I looked at it, and I said, you know what, I'm on a KX250F. I know I can clear that. So I uh, came around the corner and I got a good run at it in third gear and wham, hit that jump. And man, I cleared it by 20 feet. It was nothing. Cleared it by 20 feet where there's a turn right after that. And bam, you know, I hit the turn. So that's kind of rough. So you want to try to make the jump, you know, perfectly. So I went around and I did it again. Made it, no problem. So, you know, now it's like, okay, I don't think I can make this jump. I know I can make this jump. So I started working on, on landing you know, perfectly, and uh, all went well until about the fifth time, and uh, the fifth time, 
I woke up wondering how long I'd been laying there in the dirt and if anybody knew where I was and what day of the week it was, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know what happened. Um, something went wrong. But when I woke up, I, I looked over and I had a helmet cam on. And first of all, my bike's over there. The helmet cam is in between. And the mount for the helmet camera is laying right there in front of me. So I hit something pretty hard and broke my collarbone into three pieces. <laughs> Snap. It was sitting up like this. Um, this end was just uh, uh, trying to jab out right there. It was so painful. So I was down for six weeks, and I had a stack of guitars, you know, to do. Fortunately, the customers were pretty f forgiving about that. And also, fortunately, I had about three or four of them ready to ship. So I was able to do just some minor things one-handed. <laughs> and uh, it took ten days before I could get surgery on that collarbone. Man. So I came in here to the shop, I had a sling on, I worked one-handed for a little bit and finished up a few things. Got those guitars shipped, generated the income. Anyway, so I always try never to go riding with, you know, I wasn't going to go riding with three necks off. I want to get them on at least. So, okay. But that saying is baloney because I knew I could do it. <laughs> and I was wrong. Now, pulling forward, um, that's nice. And this is really getting snug now. That's got just a little bit of old. I really clamped that sucker down now. Okay, now, this is almost, almost there. I've got, it's hard to get on the camera here. I've got maybe a sixteenth of an inch that's not touching, so we're going to move very carefully now. Pop, I like that. It takes a little bit of force to get that neck out. One last thing I'm going to do Rather than work on the shim, because the shim can get kind of thin, you know, you can wear that shim out. So one thing, I'm going to just take my sandpaper and I'm going to come back into the body of here. I'm going to sand a little bit here and make sure I've got all that old glue out. Because just the smallest little bit of it right now can make it, make it bind. And I want a nice, smooth, slick, clean surface in here. I'm focusing more on the bottom half of it, and it's just you know it's just a matter of sanding. I'm using that stiff piece of sandpaper, finger back up. Not even really taking any wood off or anything, just getting that mating surface really clean. Let's see what we got this time. Yeah. Okay, get in there, pull, nice, <laughs> okay now, we're down to crunch time here, this is where we move very slowly, so I'm going to get my sandpaper, you know, right first when I started I had it folded in half like this, and it's starting to wear right here already. Now you can take it and you can fold it in thirds, like this, and you can get fresh surfaces. Huh? Economical. Oh, it's cheapskate. Come here and really sand carefully. Easy. Over the whole length of the thing. Just a couple of swipes. I like the fit, so I'm not focusing on any one particular place on this thing. I'm just doing the whole, the whole shim. Take my sanding stick at this time because it's flat. Sand the whole thing. Just a little. Flip it. Oh, I could have done that when I was over here, but I forgot. Okay, just a little. Get the dirt out of there. I like it. It's going to go. At this point, get a clamp, clamp it on here. What's it going to look like when it's a little bit, of, little bit more pressure than I can provide with my hands? I like that. Now, 
Remember I told you about the binding and the fingerboard, so get your feeler gauges out. I get my feeler gauges out. I get like about a six thousandth of an inch or so. And I'm going to probe it here. It's about six thousandths of an inch, and it is going all the way in. It's not hitting the fingerboard. Just a little bit, tiny, tiny, tiny bit more to go. I might, at this point, leave it alone because the glue will lubricate it. Let's see. What we got. <laughs> yeah, that's really snug. Very tight now. A little bit more. This is crunch time now. Maybe you should keep the shim even. It's easy to sand the shim crooked. If anything, I like the shim to over exaggerate the dovetail. If I like it maybe be a little bit higher in the front, a little lower in the back, and it seems to help click sometimes. Not much, you know, it's a small thing, but way better to be higher in the front than higher in the back. Okay. That's going to be it right there. Yeah, that's going to do it. Okay, here's my six thousandths of an inch just to check it and see. Pretty tight. Yeah, pretty tight. It moved in. Okay. Well, I have the clamp in here. I can pull back on the neck. It's not budging. If it did budge, it would be a budging parakeet. Yeah, that's not moving at all. I took the clamp off, you see. The neck's not popping out. Um, it's staying in there really good. Tiny, tiny, tiny bit of movement. But this is really nice up here. Uh, I like that. The keels look good. Everything looks good. This surface here looks great. So when you have a surface like this that is perfect and the other one is just a tiny, tiny bit high, you go to this shim on this side, sand it, and that way the neck will tilt this way. And that, I learned that early on. Uh, one side will be high, the other side will be perfect. And that's because this shim is thicker and it's pushing the neck up. So, I like that. I'm not going to bother with it because this is pretty tight. It's going to make it. But I might look at that shim. Take a look at it. Take a good look at it here. And we know we got a good fit. We're ready to glue. And again, I'm going to move the camera and bring you over here um, to where we're going to clamp and glue. Okay, I'm getting all my tools together here. And let's run through them real quick. This is a big C clamp. This is a block that's going to go on top of the fingerboard extension. I've got these clamps here, these cam clamps. Um, you know, a lot of people like screw type clamps, that's fine. I just, I bought these early on and I've got to use them for something. i got a little piece of wood like this that's going to fit on in between the frets and I'm going to actually clamp onto this. Um, yeah, that works well for me. <laughs> All right, we're good to go. Now, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to also use these. One of these is a quick temporary clamp. So, we're ready to go. Fish glue. Let's take this one. Fish glue. Smear it on here. Smear it around. Thank you. 
Keep the water handy because this fish glue is pretty sticky stuff. You get fish glue on your fingers and you can't. It gets all over the place. So. A little bit of glue on the extension. I like to be sure and get some glue up here in the corner. And then just smear that along. Like that. I like to get in the corner because I just do. It squeezes out and uh, hides any kind of gap or anything. That's all the glue it takes right there. I can never do this with hot hide glue because you've got about 15 seconds working time with hot hide glue. Fish glue you got quite a bit of time. Good stuff. Okay. My hands, get it off my hands. Sticky. I like it over tight bond for many reasons. Um, it's easy to take apart, blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about that later. Okay. Put the neck on. You can see it. Smack it in there. Now I'm going to grab this clamp. I'm going to clamp it with this real quick. And got it. The other thing about putting a little bit of glue up here, I can see when it squeezes out, so I know I made good contact. Okay, I'll just rock the neck back and forth, get a feel for it, I like it. I'm gonna lay it down, take this block, put it on the fingerboard. It's got a little bit of a taper to it to match the fingerboard. This guitar has that L-shaped neck block or truss rod cover, so I don't have to put another clamp in there or another um, block. If it was the 70s, I would have a second block of wood that I would clamp against. Put that on. Tighten it down a little bit. Now I pop this off. Get my piece of wood. One of these. And that piece of wood fits right in between the 12, uh, 14th and 15th fret. Clamp it down. Not all the way. Because I want this one to go down too. I don't want to tilt the neck, so. Push down. Mm, clamp it. Oh, nice. See, that push it down all the way. The the glue is lubricates. You get that last little push that way. Get this two clamp. I like that. A lot of, you know, again, a lot of people use one clamp down here, you know, but I, I like clamps. I've got control over how much pressure I can put on the sides. And I'm putting down on the side. I have a lot, you know, you hear people talk about that. Um, 14th fret hump and I have a lot less problem with that hump than I know a lot of people do and I wonder if it's because I clamp right there boom I clamp that thing down you know I don't know everybody's got their own way of doing it this is how I do it I've had good success now there's not any pressure up here so one thing I've been doing lately for the past five years is come in with these get it on the sound hole brace and I just put a little bit of extra pressure on it right there. And it's surprising how often I would see glue squeeze out. <laughs> so I know that I'm putting a little bit more pressure on the tip than I used to right there. And come in here, put a second clamp. Again, you know, people scream, oh man, you don't need those many clamps. Well, I got them. I'm going to use them. I like clamps. Take a wet ant paper towel again. Uh, same technique I used on the bridge when I was cleaning the glue up. Lock that up. Any squeeze out you got in there. Sometimes if I have a troublesome guitar or one that's uh, that I've got wider bridge spacing on or something, I might leave it clamped for 5, 10, 15 minutes or so. Take the clamps off, run the strings down the fingerboard and just take a look at it because it's so much easier to pull apart then than after it's dried again but even if I take this apart tomorrow it was steam loose just like that it, this glue won't really fully absolutely cure for probably a week it'll be good enough you know you can string it up and everything but it won't be really totally absolutely cured for quite a while I think that might be why they start to sound better after they've been strung up for, you know, a couple of three weeks. 
Um, they're always a little bit kind of mushy after a neck was shut. It takes a little bit of time for that glue to really fully cure, cure, get dry for everything to merge again. And there we go. That's a very easy neck piece yet. That's as, as easy as they come. So I'm going to leave it sit. I'm done with this guitar. It'll sit till tomorrow. Got the clamps on it. I'll take a look at it. Again. And that all looks really nice. Looks real good. Yeah, I'm very happy with that one. Invariably, when something's easy like this, there's going to be something harder later on, but maybe not. Maybe we'll cooperate. Oh, well, it's done. I'm going to do the HD28 now. So, see you later. That's how you put a neck together. Put it back together. After this, tomorrow, uh, well, tomorrow's Sunday. I'll probably sit tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow evening. Um, I'll string it up with this test saddle and leave it strung for you know three or four days whatever until i get around to it and with this test saddle then then i'll measure the action i'll determine what i need my final saddle to be and i gotta fix the nut too because remember the nut's too low it's getting a new bone nut so i'll do the bone nut um finish up the frets you know all those kind of things and then i'll leave it sitting for a couple of days with this test saddle then i'll set the final saddle and then then I'm almost done. I have a nut, I have the fets, I have the saddle. I need to slot the bridge still, I need to do a pick guard on it. And I can do all of that stuff while it's under tension. I like to leave it sitting for a week minimum before I really do the final saddle. Two weeks is a lot better. I've had a lot of guitars after two weeks where I had to you know, adjust the action down just a little bit. And then it'll be done. But when I get the neck on, we're moving down the final stretch. This is when I send the customer's bill. <laughs> okay. Put this up, get the HD out.